Good evening. Thank you so much for coming back this evening. What a gorgeous day. Faith and I had a kind of a quiet day today. Uh, this afternoon it was good. Choir practice was superb. Um, we uh, still need some folks in the choir. Easter is, is in about t 10 minutes. So the uh, sooner you join, the better off we'll be. Uh, we are planning some a good... Um, a Passover service on the Wednesday before Good Friday. We will have a Good Friday service. And then, of course, Easter Sunday is always fabulous, too. So we appreciate that. Could I share just a few announcements with you? Don't forget to sign up for the Women's Bible Study coming up. Um, uh, it'll be on the book of Isaiah. They're hitting uh, the mountaintop of the book of Isaiah. It'll be uh, starting on March the 21st. So uh, keep that in mind, and we would appreciate you signing up so we'll know how many books to order. Um, uh, we also would mention the Triumphant Quartet will be here with us on March the 16th. We'll have our February supper this Wednesday evening. Donna is, I texted with Donna here earlier this evening, and she is feeling much better. She had a little bug that is kind of settling out, and, and she is recuperating. We're going to have soup and sandwiches, chili and grilled cheese, Chocolate crunch or strawberry crunch ice cream cake, y'all, y'all, just all those good things. Uh, we also would just mention to you uh, the Constitution and Bylaws is out, at least the review part of it, and we will, I want you to look at that, and then we will have about a month between February and the business meeting in March, and the uh, um, review team will be presenting that in March. Good. Okay. So that'll be sent out here later on this month to clarify all of the suggested changes to where it'll be clear as could be. And then we will vote on that coming up in the March business meeting. But we've had, they've really been meticulous and taken their time to try to clarify that and make sure that we're up to speed. Uh, and, and we bring it up. We will take care of that in March. Also mentioned to you, uh, the adults are headed to dinner Tuesday the 28th to Ron's Roost. And, of course, business meeting is this Wednesday night, our regular monthly business meeting, so we'll appreciate that too. Uh, but considering all these things, let me mention two other things that Colin had mentioned to us. Uh, he said he needed um, to remind folks that the $75 deposit is due by the 28th of February for the Crossing Summer Camp for our youth. And uh, there are some who have financial issues that they may need our help. If you'd like to help with that, if you'd like to sponsor a kid or even just sponsor their, uh, their down payment, their deposit, uh, we'd be glad to do that. Also, uh, deposits are $75, and um, I'm not exactly sure how much the camp is. But this is the first year that we're going to actually the KBC Crossings Camp and it'll be, it's always just top-notch, so we appreciate that. And then uh, tomorrow evening, 4.30 to 7, Annie Abner leads our great team down to Madison Avenue to help with the feeding kitchen for the homeless, and they need a few extra hands tomorrow. And Kay works there vast majority of Mondays of the month. Every Monday for how many years? 16 years. So uh, it's, it's good just being the hands and feet of Christ. And you can go down and do that. So just see Annie or uh, see Kay. Kay will tell you what time to show up. It's from 4.30 to 7. So uh, they, they'll take care of that. And the meals will be prepared. And it uh, looks like it's going to be really good weather. So we appreciate that. Any other announcements we need to make? Thank you for the clarification on those other things. Um, I'm hearing more and more good news. If you haven't got online and watched what's going on at Asbury College uh, Bible College Seminary and all of that, you need to do that. It, it won't be exactly the same as being there. Uh, we had folks who've gone down this week. Some of them waited as many as four hours just to get a seat. They're waiting outside the building. Michael? It's all right. I, 
let me let me let me just announce what we're talking about here. Let me clarify that because what is revival? It is a unique moving of the Holy Spirit. No, no, it was not. It was spontaneous. It was started at a chap at a regular chapel service before a word was ever preached. It actually started out during the music and worship of the service. And and they just felt the powerful presence of God's Holy Spirit and started to repent. They began to weep. They began to move forward and make decisions without even being invited. And, and what, what I'm saying is, not only has it caught at Asbury, but it's caught at Cedarville. It's catching on at Cumberland and Transylvania and UK. And we, John, John Shea has granddaughters down in Florida going to college there. They've been going to church the last four weeks. Their pastor announced this morning. He said, after this morning's service, I need to get in the car. I'm going to Kentucky from Boca Raton, Florida. He said, I want to go to Asbury. I want to see what the Holy Spirit's doing. I want to discover what's going on. And let me say this. Anytime you have authentic revival, not just the revivals we plan, but the revivals that the, are just Holy Spirit and Word driven, anytime you have revivals, two things show up explicitly. Number one is repentance and obedience. You never have anything. Anytime you have revival, it's repentance and obedience. You are obedient to what God has told you to do. John's granddaughter said uh, there were, that she feels compelled, though she's been raised in another church. She says, next Sunday, I'm going to be baptized in this little non-denominational church down there in Florida. She says, I, I could hardly stand it today, going to church, hearing the word of God preached, sung, and ministered. And she says, I'm, I just need to be baptized by immersion to be true to God's word. So every time God's Holy Spirit moves, it is, it is repentance and obedience, repentance and obedience, repentance and obedience. And then as the revival continues, then evangelism starts. You see, we have to get right before we can help the world know God. So anytime you see that moving, it is always in that order. God shows up in sermons. God shows up in music. God shows up in small groups. God shows up in little churches. He shows up in big churches. And we're seeing that happen in our area. Uh, Turner Ridge Baptist Church down in Pendleton County. We have a, another church in F Falmouth that they have expanded over the last year, and it's the moving of God's Holy Spirit. He is speaking peace and power to people. Uh, Bob and Janet Watson's daughter helps with the church over in Kenton County. This week, they were given the opportunity. You need to vote at least two-thirds majority if you're going to pull out of, the, of a woke convention and get and follow God's word. And today they had to have 330 votes to move out of the convention. They had over 400 votes saying we're going to follow God. We're going to follow his word. And that's what God's spirit does. It's not easy. Sometimes it's expensive, but it always, always, always includes repentance and, and obedience. Sometimes for undone works unfinished commitments, that we get back into God's Word, that we get back into His plan, the Great Commission and the Great Commandment. And these kids, this generation who have been so disconnected for a decade are now face-to-face -face putting down their phones and telling their neighbors they love them and want them to know Jesus as Savior. That's God's Spirit moving. Now, we can set times, we can set meetings, but if we want revival, we have to go to God and say, God, would you move in a mighty way? That's it. I've seen it. I've seen it, Michael, from time to time, and uh, I would love to see it today. Yeah, absolutely. I've seen God's Spirit move in such a powerful way. People who... People... And I'm not saying they do crazy things, but they do things outside of their comfort zone, outside of their personality, outside of their type, and they do things so amazing that God alone gets the credit for it. Deb? Yes, ma'am. Late 60s, early 70s, it happened at Asbury, and it was part of the tail end of the Jesus movement, and it corrected us from being Pharisees to being family. You hear my heart on that? Beloved, we, we, we appreciate rules and regulations. We appreciate the Ten Commandments. But, beloved, if we don't speak the truth in love, we're missing it. We have to speak the truth in love. 
And if we, if we love people, we have to speak the truth. So it's kind of cyclic when we do that. But thank you for that question. Any other thing? Then I'm so thankful that we're here together. And, and we will keep you up to date as things progress, as things happen. Uh, we want to share with you what God, great things He has done. And not us, great things He has done. If you would, stand with us. Jackie's going to lead us in her evening worship song. And then we'll, uh, I think I've asked, uh, oh yes, Ronnie. Ronnie's going to lead us in a word of prayer. Thank you. Well, as you guys continue to go through the um, travels of the Jewish people uh, once they've been freed from uh, Egypt's hand and they're wandering the desert and Moses' great desire was to follow the Lord out of his comfort zone. And so this, this is, I think, a, a pretty good song to support him but also or his story, but also uh, hopefully for each of us as we move through, through life that we would be looking for God's guidance and, and leadership. And we just start right off on this. Ready? Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow. All your ways are good. All your ways are sure. I will trust in you. somebody and grab their hand. I don't want anybody to be by themselves. Just hold on to at least one hand there around you. And uh, Ronnie's going to lead us in a word of prayer. Ronnie, you lead us. Would you please, brother? Father God, we just thank you for the blessing of being in your house again tonight after the awesome time we had this morning and the wonderful service that we had. Father God, we just look forward to hearing your word again through Pastor Rick and we just thank you for empowering Rick with your word to bring it to us and pray that all that we hear here tonight and every time we come that we'll take it with us and go out from here and try to spread it to other people and Father God we pray that you open our hearts when you allow us to do this. Father we just lift up all the ones that are on our on our hearts that we've lost yeah. recently the ones that are sick among us 
And we thank you for your healing and us being able to just lift them up to you. Father God, we just um, thank you for this congregation and all the love they show to each other. Mm -hmm. And we just thank you for all the blessings you place in our lives each mm -hmm. and every day. And Father, we especially thank you for Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Yeah. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. You're welcome to be seated. I would mention to you, we do need to pray one prayer in particular at the close of this service. Yes, in Mackenzie Mitchum, uh, due to governmental re regulations uh, from where they're at in Thailand, had to fly to Malaysia. They're in Malaysia. Um, here it is, 7.30 in the evening. It's, it's early in the morning there. Uh, they are taking their girls there in hopes to get them a more permanent visa. Right now, they've been able to stay for 90 days, but they had to go out of the country to go to the consulate in Malaysia to come back. It's extremely expensive, plus it just distracts them from the work. So at the close of tonight's service, uh, they're going to be going into the, the Taiwanese consulate in Malaysia at 7.30 tonight, our time. It'll be in the morning, tomorrow morning for them. But uh, if you would, we, before we leave, let's pray for them. Lift them up. We, we don't want to forget uh, all of our missionaries uh, near and far, and we surely appreciate that. Our Bible study tonight is going to go back to the book of Joshua. Last week, we, we took a huge leap. We left Egypt uh, with Pharaoh and his armies drowning in the Red Sea. Uh, we see now... God moving them into the wilderness. And you know what's going to happen. He's going to take them in a matter of a short period of time, three or four weeks, up to the edge of the promised land. They're going to look into the promised land. They're going to spy it out, and they're going to discover that it's exactly what God described to them. It is a land that flows with milk and honey. But the problem is they come back and they get outvoted. There are 12 tribes, 10 vote, 10 vote to uh, the, the, the land is exactly what God describes, but they're giants in the land, and we can't do it. We're not warriors. We're not fit. We're not able. We're grasshoppers, as Scripture says, in their sight. And yet Joshua and Caleb said they'll be like bread before us. And because of that, God causes an entire generation of Hebrews to die in the wilderness. Now, we could go to the brazen serpent on the pole. We could go to the honey in the rock. We could go to the water from the rock. We could go to the Ten Commandments in Mount Sinai and break the Ten Commandments. We could go through 40 years of the wilderness and we would get lost too. We're not going to do that. We are not going to get lost in the wilderness. This is a timeline study. So if you could imagine all the events of an entire generation of people dying in the wilderness and the only ones that make it into the promised land are Joshua and Caleb and the youngest of the nation who've been set free. These folks are growing up in freedom, though they're living in some ways like Bedouins, going from pillar to post, trying to find water, trying to find food, doing all those kinds of things. And now finally, they're going into the promised land. The, the ten negative spies have died off in their entire generation. Joshua and Caleb are there. Moses, because of he, he had anger management issues. Can I get an amen? God said, Moses, um, you're going to die this side of the River Jordan. Now, now, what's kind of amazing is since 1948, the Israeli government and the nation of the Hebrews may have claimed where Moses is buried, but God buried him so secretly that the devil himself couldn't find his body. It's a weird, wonderful story. And yet Moses does not get to go into the promised land. So Moses is dead. Joshua is the newly elected leader. He is the newly established leader. And as he starts into the promised land, he needs to get some things straight. Now, I want you to be mindful of this, too. Just as the children of Israel, when they left Egypt and they left the soggy, drowned armies of Egypt in the Red Sea, they had to step by faith with Charlton Heston holding up the rod in the Red Sea. And, and they walked through dry shod and, and, and they had to go out by faith. Guess what's going to happen in tonight's Bible study? They, too, are going to have to cross the Jordan River, but it's going to be during the flood stage. So just as the older generation who did not have complete faith, God is requiring the same thing, a water crossing in flood stage. So God is going to stack up the Jordan River, and in the process, they're going to meet Rahab. 
And um, I love the story of Rahab. It's a story of hope. It's a story of resilience. It's a story of adoption. It's a story of faith because she recognized that the children of Israel that were coming into the country, they were followers of Almighty God. And when we look at Rahab, I want to see her honestly and openly. Uh, about 1340 to 1400, sometime in that window, the Catholic Church tried to clean up Rahab's reputation. Uh, today we talk about getting a side hustle, you know, where you have your regular job, but you need a little extra money to buy eggs, and you have a side hustle to make those eggs. Well, Rahab had a side hustle. Yes, she was an innkeeper, but I want you to translate, and I don't want to make a big deal out of it, but I want to show you how God is no respecter of persons. And there is no sin so great that God and the blood of Jesus Christ cannot cleanse. So when you look at this, uh, Rahab was an innkeeper, but she had a side hustle. And I want to show you the word in the Hebrew, translated into the Greek, and I want you to get this, because I've had, I've had uh, uh, greater scholars than myself Say, oh, no, no, that's not the way it was. God would not do that. Let me tell you, if God continued to allow Samson to be a judge, if he allowed Judas to follow Jesus around for three years, if he allowed these other yahoos like uh, the sons of thunder, can you relate to the sons of thunder, James and John? God, God is inviting to all people without bias or prejudice. And he wants us to come to that place to where we follow him and leave our sin and leave ourself and step forward in faith. So as we look at this, we want to begin tonight in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. And, and I know it sounds a bit odd, an odd place since we're in the Old Testament but in 2 Corinthians, this clarifies something. You'll recognize these verses here tonight as we read them. Therefore, remember, anytime you see that, you need to pay special attention to the context of the passage. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. When you cross over and you start following God, you leave behind some things that have held you back for all of those years. When you cross over, the future to them looked extremely bleak. The Israelites, even after they'd gone through all the wilderness, the pillar of fire by night, the pillar of cloud by day, the manna from heaven, six days a week for 40 years, they get to the edge of the promised land and guess the first city they come to. What is the first city they come to? Jericho. Jericho is a walled city. They have discovered the ruins. It is, and any time we go, when we go to Israel, one of the things they use is, is a word, they call it a tell, T-E-L-L. Anytime you see that word in the geography and the geology of Israel, it means a rising that is not ordinary or common. So a tell can be a mountain, can be a unique feature like Mount Hermon to the north or uh, or, or Masada in the south. It is an extreme tell. But anytime you see the desert fields, the flatness of Jericho, and, I, and we've been there, it's just north of the Dead Sea. When you go to Jericho, it is a pretty flat area of the country. It is low, below sea level, and when you get to that place, the problem is for years and years they thought that there was, that, that Jericho was a myth until about 35 years ago when they discovered that it was on a tell. So here on the desert floor, desert floor, desert floor, desert floor, desert floor, desert floor, desert floor. And they said, this would be a good place to dig. Something happened here. They went in, they started to uncover ancient things of, of, of absolute Old Testament knowledge and when they uncovered it, what was so amazing was that it was so obscure and had not been seen for thousands of years because it was slight. And when they got into it, they discovered that not one stone of the wall of Jericho stood on another. They all fell down flat. And it made it almost obscure, anonymous in that Dead Sea region valley. Now, with that being said, 
Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. What does that have to do? The old of the unfaithful Hebrews died off in the wilderness. The next generation is taking over. And beloved, don't ever look. We, Colin has some kids to baptize here the first Sunday of March in about two weeks. We have others that are interested. We're talking with their parents, trying to help them be prepared. And don't ever say, oh, they're the church of tomorrow. No, no, no. They're already the church of today. They already have been blessed with the call of God. And though they may be young like David when he was in the shepherd's field, don't underestimate. Somebody needs to be the next Billy Graham. Somebody needs to be the next Lottie Moon. Somebody needs to step up and do things so amazing, so out there, so unbelievable that only God can get the credit. So with that beginning, uh, let's, let's also go ahead and kind of consider this. Uh, throughout Joshua, the book of uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, right? Six book, is that right? Okay, thank you. You're with me and you're still listening. Uh, Joshua is that, it is the first book not written by Moses. So we see this, Joshua is taking the reins of the entire nation. Babies have been born, families have been raised, marriages have happened, lots of burials in the wilderness. And in Joshua 1, 3 through 5, God reassures Joshua throughout that entire first chapter that he can be strong and courageous. Why do you think God would repeat himself over and over and over? Why do you think it was necessary for God to repeat that phrase, be strong and courageous? We get sometimes in our mind, don't we, Diane? We get that in our mind. We're just grasshoppers before their sight. We can't do anything. We're not warriors. We're nomads. We've been living in the wilderness for 40 years. And what have we seen? Pillar of fire by night, pillar of cloud by day, manna from heaven. But who are we? God's done all the fighting. We can't go over into the promised land. What else keeps them? Why does God have to repeat this? Be strong. Be of good courage. What else? My goodness, that's, that's, that's the key of teaching, isn't it? Every teacher and every good preacher, and I'm not saying I'm always a good preacher, they tell you what they're going to tell you, they tell you, and then they tell you what they told you. Repetition is a good tool for teachers. We need to repeat those scriptures. We need to repeat this phrase. We need to repeat this thought because by saying it, writing it, it becomes a more part of our system. What else, Michael? Repetition is the mother of that. Whether it be sports or whether it be intellectual things, it is muscle memory. If it's sports, you repeat it. You do it so often that it's it's just that way. I, I will. Can I brag on Will just a little bit? Okay. Uh, will, um, Mike's oldest grandson, has been coming here to the Christian Life Center for years. He's been coming in a lot of times when they have snow days in the winter. Brad would bring Will in. Uh, different folks would, would let Will in. Mike would supervise him. He would catch the rebounds and feed Will. And now Will is doing something in high school. Is he a junior or a senior? He's a senior, He's a senior this year. And where does he go to school? Highlands. He, last week, broke the three-point record for Highlands in their entire history. For the whole region, so so he's he stand out and and he absolutely comes with his little sister, comes with his dad, comes with Shannon and his mom. They they're here and and you know, and if you don't go to the ball games, you'd never know that. And I'm saying this: these are young people that have not so young people encouraging them. Isn't that just cool? Yeah. Amen. Amen. And, I, and, I, and like I say, Michael is thankful, and it's kind of kept Will here in our church. And um, it's just been a blessing to that family. And let me say, we do that on a regular basis. Uh, we, we don't want this building to rust out. We'd rather it wear out. That's our intention for this whole place. So as we look at what's happening here in this passage of Scripture, be strong and be courageous. So God had made a covenant promise back in Genesis 17. Look at that with me. 
uh, book of Genesis, chapter 17. And, and this is a good place to remind you of that in verse 8, where, where this is said, from God to Moses, or excuse me, to Abraham, also I give to you and your descendants after you in the land, you the land, I messed that up, I, I can't let that go. I have to read it again correctly. Also, I give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all of the land of Canaan, as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God's been true of that, true to that. Now, you may have heard that it is part of it is Palestine. Beloved, it's never been Palestine. The only close, even close resemblance to that is it was a part of the Philistines. Not the Palestinians, but the Philistines at some former time. And God overthrew those, those sons, those giants in the land. He did that even through David. Remember the story of Goliath. And he went to the brook Cherith and he picked up how many stones? Five stones. Did he think he would miss four times? No. Goliath had four brothers and they were big guys too. So keep this in mind. God is preparing all of these things. David thought he might have to fight all five of them. So we don't, don't get confused with what you hear from modern day politics that this is Palestine. This has been promised by God to Abraham originally from the beginning. And he, even though he was a stranger in that land, and you remember when Abraham died, the only property that he owned personally was his wife's gravesite. God had not yet fulfilled the promise, but he was getting ready to fulfill that promise. So this is the promise, the covenant promise that God made with Abraham. Now, if you will, um, we want to look at the Israelites in Jericho who stood, um, who stood beside the river Jordan. Look at Isaiah 43, 2. Book of Isaiah. There we go. 43 and verse 2. Now remember, Isaiah is a major prophet uh, in the Old Testament. He wrote a huge book that tried to kill me back when I was in seminary. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, they shall not, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. Isn't it kind of unusual? That when we look at prophecy, we have a tendency to look at it in the future, but God looks at it as if there is no timeline there whatsoever. God promises that we're going to able, be able to walk through the floodwaters of the Red Sea, the floodwaters of the Jordan River, like Daniel, to walk through the fire of Nebuchadnezzar. He'll be able to walk through those places. If God is with us, we can do all things. Be strong and be courageous. Now... With that, look back at Joshua 3, 7, and I know I'm moving fast, but I really do want to uh, get caught up to this and get to our points. Uh, that's one of the things I missed this morning. Uh, we've been teaching Sunday school to the Fresh Start class, and we had a good number today, and they had a lot of questions. So I lingered and answered the questions after today's Bible study, and I had three typewritten Full, three full typewritten pages with graphs and everything else about the church so they had a lot of questions and, and you, have, you have one of these young moms sits there and say why are there so many denominations there's an easy answer that says trust me and then there's a hard answer that says this is actually why there's so many denominations why there are 368 different types of Baptists shame on us <laughs> So as we look at this, Joshua 3, 7 says, And the Lord said to Joshua, This day I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. This is where we start. We turn the page. We've been in the wilderness for 40 years, and I know it just seems like a week but we've been in the wilderness 40 years. We're getting ready to cross the flood, flooded waters of the River Jordan, and God is preparing them for the difficult challenges ahead. Why is that? Well, first of all, Moses was 120 years old when he died. And they say, oh, Brother Eckert, you know, do you really believe that stuff? 
Deb's dad is how old, Deb? 103 right now. So, that's, I mean, that's not too far-fetched. Now, I'll guarantee you Deb's dad does not want to live to be 120. But, but the idea is this. is Moses is 120 years old. He spent 40 years in Pharaoh's house, 40 years in Jethro's house, and now he's spent 40 years in leading the children of Israel. He dies at 120 years old, and this young 80-year-old whippersnapper is going to take the reins. They know about Joshua. They've heard about Joshua. They've heard about his faith. So God has to lead them through something so dramatic, so amazing, that Joshua gets a name of strength in front of the people. And guess where he takes him? To an inn where Rahab has a side hustle. Okay, we'll get into that. I don't want to overlook Rahab at all. In fact, if anything, I want to exalt the grace of God that saves people from other nations. Um, you know, prejudice isn't just um, a modern thing. Prejudice has been here since the Tower of Babel. Maybe before, but I can take it back all the way to the Tower of Babel where we have been separated from one another. What we look at and see in this great lesson is Rahab to the Israelites, even though they're not too far away, Abraham is their father, Isaac and Jacob. Now we come up to this place to where we're seeing great things happen. They've spent, four, spent hundreds of years under the, the, the heavy boot of Pharaoh. They've been in the wilderness for 40 years, and now Joshua, this young new leader, is taking a, a stand. And they go in, and Rahab hides the spies. In fact, they quiz her about that, and she, does she tell the truth? I think that'd be a good question to answer. She minds God, I know that, because she is actually woven into the lineage of Jesus himself. But when you look at this, I want you to notice what's said about Rahab in Joshua chapter 2 and verse 1. Joshua 2, 1. And see what happens. We may read a couple of verses after this just to kind of catch up on this. Joshua 2, 1. Now Joshua, the son of Nun, sent out two men from Acacia Grove to spy secretly, saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho. So they went and came to the house of the harlot, of a harlot named Rahab, and lodged there. And it was told the king of uh, of Jericho saying behold men have come here tonight from the children of Israel to search out the country see what's happening here is kind of amazing is these foreigners who've been living in the Judean wilderness between Egypt and and the promised land for 40 years are a huge number of people I remember when they left Egypt they said that the number was around 600,000 men not including their wives and their children so easily you have over a million people in the wilderness, a million people drinking water, a million people getting manna, a million people, and everyone in the region are fearful of them because they're such a huge number of people for this region. So when these two spies come in, I don't know whether it's their clothing, I don't know whether they were alerted by the devil himself trying to thwart the will of God, but the simple fact about it is as they start into the land, they gain the attention while they're in this inn. Now, are they prejudiced? Actually, they're extremely afraid because they've heard of the miracles of the brazen serpent and the vipers. They've heard of the miracles of water and honey from the rock. They've heard about the manna. Anytime they've ever come even near to these people, there's either been a cloud over them or a fire over them because of the power and provision of the presence of God. So as we look at this together, something amazing is happening. God is moving, and he's moving by giving them enough information to know what to do next. So I want you to notice what happens in verse 3 of chapter 2. So the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you, who have entered your house, for they have come to search out the country. What did they mean by that? Spy out the country. Then the woman took the two men and hid them, so she said, Yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were from.
That was a partial truth. So a partial truth is a full-blown what? Absolutely. I did not know where they were from. And it happened as the gate was being shut when it was dark that the men went out. We'll stop there on that point. What's going on here? This is Joshua's advanced team. God is directing them to an inn who has a harlot who is the innkeeper. She has a reputation for that. Now, now before I go very far into this, I want you to understand that in this area of the world, temple prostitutes were common. So this would not be so uh, terrible and dark and nefarious as it is today. Now, I'm not saying it's good. Don't get me wrong. I, I, I'm not saying that it's good. But I am saying it would have been so commonplace for her to have this side hustle. So I went to the old Hebrew word that they used in this passage of Scripture, and the Hebrew word for her in this instance is the Hebrew word zona, which is, is, is innkeeper, but when it's translated into the Greek, and it's only used a couple of times in all of Scripture. So it's not like there are hundreds of Scriptures to search out. There are just a couple. When you translate this idea, this Old Testament Hebrew word into Greek, it is porne, uh, porne, porne. So when you look at it, it just jumps out at you, doesn't it? Isn't it pretty clear? Now, now I'm not saying that, that I'm bragging on this trade or anything else. It is, as the world calls it, one of the oldest professions in the world. This would have been extremely common in these types of days. But I want you to look at Rahab's identity in the book of Hebrews. Turn back to the New Testament book of Hebrews, chapter 11. And what do we call Hebrews 11? Hall of Fame of Faith or the Hall of Faith. And look at verse 31. Now the word for harlot here is the same word that the Hebrews use for Rahab back in the book of Joshua. So when we translate it to Greek and now to English, it just leaps out at us. Now again, is this something that all of us just feel comfortable talking about? It's not a conversation that I normally have in a given week in the office of First Baptist Church Cold Spring. But I will say this, that God is very honest. His integrity is impeccable. And his word is intentional. Don't ever underestimate what God is doing here. He is proving to us the power of grace. Look at verse 31. As, uh, and and who, who wrote the book of Hebrews? Nobody knows. Nobody knows. I'm with Kay Whitmer. I think Paul did. But again, I think he... I, in my, I, I'll be real shocked when I get to heaven. Not when I get to heaven. I know I'm going to heaven. But I'll be shocked when I get there if Paul is not the one that wrote the book of Hebrews. But if he is, I'm going to say to all those naysayers, I told you so. Well, maybe not in heaven. Maybe I won't say that. But, but notice what the author, whoever it is, inspired by the Holy Spirit, this is what the author says. By faith, the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe when she had received the spies with peace. Now, make your own judgment. Now, what I look and see about this is so obvious that her identity as an innkeeper is more than that. She has the ability to gain more revenue by this side hustle. There's a whole lot to this story. Um, it, a few Christmases ago, I preached on the lineage of Jesus out of the book of Matthew. And I cannot tell you how many people came to him and said, Brother Rick, I've never heard that before. Because we brought up people that by God's grace, he so richly provided salvation to. And God's hand is not short even to this day. So she trusted him for righteousness, righteousness that she could not produce in her own life. That's where we are. So, any questions about Rahab? Please, Diane. Yeah, 
she didn't have all the information. Remember when they got the Ten Commandments, where were they? They were still in the wilderness with Moses. It could have been 25 years before. could have been 30 years before. So the Ten Commandments had not made it out beyond this bubble of the Hebrews yet. Now we hear it. We, we can look at the book of Exodus and see every one of the commands. But when it comes to this place to her, it was accepted. I don't want to say it was normal, but it was a part of, of the pagan worship. And for her to do this as a side hustle was not something that would cause our eyebrows to stand up. Uh, and, and, and so they, the Hebrews received the law of God first, but it had not gone very much beyond that people. I saw another hand over this way, Brother Bill. Brother Bill has given me a three-point sermon that I don't have time for tonight. But it is absolutely true, Brother Bill. A Christian to a Christian, we ought to be honest. We ought to love each other enough that we tell each other the truth. And, and, and uh, you know, that's how we get things fixed. If you, if you have a problem with me, the Bible tells you how to fix it. It says, Matthew 18, you come to me, you come to me in private and say, Brother Rick, I've got a problem with you. I've got a bone pick with you. Okay, let's sit down. And if, you, if I don't hear you, then what are you to do? Bring a witness. And if you don't hear them, then it comes up to we, where we practice church discipline. We don't see that a whole lot today because there are so many iPhones everywhere. Still in the scripture, though. Bill says you ought not, Christians ought not lie to one another. Actually, in general, we ought not be liars. Or that should not be a part of the fabric of our life. And when it comes to witnessing to someone, we need to love them enough to tell them the truth. But... In this case, to protect the innocent, to protect the children of God, Rahab limits the amount of truth that she exposes. Well, what was on her heart? Her heart was to protect these two spies that, that were getting ready to slip back out of the city and bring in... Could there have been a million men at this time after 40 years? Who knows? I mean, it's a huge number of people. And, and the city of Jericho to this day... To this day is only thousands. So you could understand why it needed to be walled. So when it comes to this point, this is the great point that Brother Bill is going to preach one day if I ever give him a chance. And that is that are there instances where need to, we, need to, we need to focus on God's will and mind that and not put our other brothers and sisters in harm's way? I get that. I don't have time for it. Let's move on. Any other question or comment? Please, Lee. Well, obviously, she joined up with the Hebrews, but Lee says this for our World Wide Web audience. When Jericho was destroyed, and you remember what happened, they walked around the city of Jericho in quietness for six days. Every day. Could you imagine how that must, the shadow of that, and just the rumbling of a million feet walking around the city of Jericho every day. And every time the, the soldiers are on edge, their bows are drawn, they're ready. They're just outside of the range of, of, of the, air, the archers of Jericho. And every day the line starts, and every day it ends at the same place, and they go back home. Now this is an odd military experience. They come the second day, the third day, the fourth day, the fifth day, the sixth day. On the seventh day, where's the Sabbath in that? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, it blew my mind too. On the seventh day, how many times do they walk around the city? Seven times. And on the seventh time, what do they do that's so unique? They shout, blow the trumpets, and... and <laughs> And made all kinds of noise as loud as they could, and uh, and the walls came a tumbling down. And Lee is absolutely right. He says in that case they destroyed the inn of Rahab. 
She lost her livelihood. She lost her place. But she was adopted into the Hebrew family and became a part of the followers of Almighty God by faith. <laughs> Absolutely. She, she ended up being the great-grandmother of David. So she was adopted into this family. Though she was raised as a pagan, raised far from God, God, through her acts of obedience to him, brought them back in. And she actually ended up being in the lineage of, the, of Jesus himself, okay? Okay, says, I think the story of Rahab teaches us that God can use anybody, even hillbillies. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, look, if you will, Joshua 1, 8, and 9. I know we're kind of jumping around, doing a little spiritual hopscotch here, but Joshua 1, 8. There's a crossing over, and what does it take? That's the idea. The commitment to crossing over requires a clear direction from God's voice, from his word. And, and when he transferred the leadership from Moses to Joshua, he, 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 made, he asked Joshua to do something so outrageous, so out there, that he had to follow his command to try to set him up as the new leader of the tribe of Israel. This is what it says, Joshua 1, 8 and 9. The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. What is the book of the law? Not just the Ten Commandments, is it? If Pentateuch in includes that. I think, it, of course, you look at Deuteronomy in particular where God gives the Levitical law on how you're supposed to operate spiritually, how you're supposed to manage the country, how you're supposed to answer the people, even the book of Judges. Judges, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And how did they pass on these books of the law? Verbal. Verbal. It was very verbal. They would quote that to their kids. It would be quoted to them. It was repetition. It was that great tool that our teachers have pointed out. Now look a little bit further that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you, be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed, for the Lord, uh, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. I want to sidestep Israel going through the floodwaters of the River Jordan to make it up to Jericho. Now, it looks radically different today. We've been there many times. Um, now, what's kind of amazing now is the desert is starting to shrink and the green is starting to grow like it once was. They're watering, irrigating. It's not only technical and scientific, but it's very productive. They have uh, beautiful date palms and banana groves and, and olive trees in the middle of the desert. And they meticulously water them um, with computer chips. They measure the hydration of the water. It gets exactly the water that it needs. So there's plenty of sunshine. Actually, in some cases, too much sunshine, sunshine. So they cover it with a mesh, almost what I would, looks like a cheesecloth to me. A huge tent of cheesecloth. So it filters out some of those bad rays or the too intense rays, and then the water is retained, and all of this desert is starting to blossom. Now, if you could imagine 3,000 years ago plus, when Joshua leads the children of Israel over to Jericho, it was green. The Dead Sea was much farther north toward the city of Jericho. Minerals, spices, all of these things, it was a traditional trade route. But they still had to cross the swollen waters of the River Jordan. Again, much larger than what it is today because you've got millions of people using the Jordan River for their primary source of water. <clears throat> so God says, be of good courage, don't be dismayed, follow me wherever I tell you to go. I would ask you, what water crossings are you afraid of? What crossing over do we need to do? What do we need to leave behind that we might gain the promise? What do we need to forget that we might remember the good? 
And this is where we find ourselves in this instance. Um, see, the devil doesn't want you to cross over. He wants you to continue to wander in your own personal wilderness. He wants you to stay in one locality, in one fixed position, to where you're not asked to do anything amazing or outrageous. Just do yesterday over and over and over and over. But for us to move forward, it's going to take courage. For us to move forward, first of all, we need to hear the Word of God. But if God calls on us to move forward, and I'm you know, here at the end of... Uh, well, June, July will be our 10th anniversary. I've got the date. I figured it out the other day. Brother Lee asked me about that. We'll be here 10 years. I, I stand here and I'm amazed at how many funerals I've done in 10 years. Giants of the faith. Men like Les Warner. Lee Hopkins. These giants of the faith. And, and, and I stand here and I say, God, you've got to raise up leaders. God, you've got to bring in people that to not just fill in the gaps of these giant shoes, but, but we have to cross over to a new generation. Now, God doesn't change. God's word is not going to change. I mean, people have tried to get it to change for thousands of years. And he said, heaven and earth will pass away. Not one jot or tittle, not one comma, not one hyphenated, not, not one accent mark of God's word is going to disappear. God is going to keep his word pure. And his word says, be of good courage and cross over. But you don't know, Brother Rick, what kind of a jam I'm in. But you don't know, Brother Rick, how I've been raised. But you don't know, Brother Rick, how my heart is broken. But you don't know, Brother Rick, how much I've lost. You don't know, Brother Rick, the prognosis that doctors gave me. You don't know, Brother Rick, the losses that I've experienced. Is that being courageous? Or is that being stuck? I think we can learn a lot from this timeline of the Hebrew people when God reminds them of this great and solemn vow that God's might does not lead you to failure, but many times he does lead us to sacrifice. The Christian life, for it to expand and grow, cannot be lived for safety. One last scripture, Joshua, 20, Joshua 4, 24, and we'll finish up. Joshua 4, 24. Crossing over is founded in faith that God will lead the way. You understand this entire generation of young people that never was. They were, they were either minors or they weren't even born 40 years before. And yet for 40 years they've seen food fall from heaven every night. For 40 years they felt the warmth of the fire of God every night. For 40 years, they felt the shade of the pillar of cloud from God every single day. This is a different generation of people. But notice what it says in Joshua 4, 24. That all the peoples of the earth may know the hands of the Lord, that it is mighty, that you may fear the Lord your God forever. And I believe that is knowledge and reverential fear in this case. Old hymn says it this way. He leadeth me. Oh, blessed thought. Oh, words with heavenly comfort fraught. Whate'er I do, where'er I be, still tis God's hand that leadeth me. He leadeth me, he leadeth me, by his own hand he leadeth me. His faithful follower I would be, for by his hand he leadeth me. Could you imagine this little tiny nine-year-old hand? 
trying to hold on to God as a nine-year-old boy by the unction of the Holy Spirit and by the preaching of the word I reached up and God grabbed my hand and I have been so blessed by his leading um, my daughter Rachel was younger than any kid sitting over here we we're headed into a little church that I pastored in Wayne County West Virginia and it was, I think it was Palm Sunday, and there was a skiff of snow on the ground. And she was dressed with a little puffy dress and a little purse and little patent leather shoes. And when you say patent leather, you know it, they were just plastic. And she had her little tights on, and, and, and she had a little hat. And I was leading her into church, and, and the snow had melted off of the grass. But as we got to the steps of the church... She was just so stinking proud of herself. She th wanted to turn loose of my hand. Daddy, I can do it myself. I saw what she was about to do, getting ready to hit the snow and ice on the front porch of the church. And as she stepped, she lost all traction with those little plastic shoes. And I just picked her up by her arm, one-handed. And, 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 and I put her on the porch where the snow hadn't gotten and she looked at me and so prissily said, I hanged on, didn't I? <laughs> she did not hang on to me, nor do I hang on to God. He hangs on to us. That's who he is. That's who he will be. So what do you need to cross over? What do you need to leave behind? And what might you gain if you don't have fear and you have a heart of courage. And it's all down to this. Is God trustworthy or not? I stand as Jackie's going to lead us in an evening hymn. You come if God's spoken to you today. the Lord and be of good courage. Your mighty defender is always the same. Mount up with wings as the eagle ascending. Victory is yours when you call on his name. Be strong, be strong, be strong in the Lord and be of good courage for He is your guide. Be strong, be strong, be strong in the Lord and rejoice for the victory is yours. Kids, could you come over and get around me? Just come right around here. We're going to pray for Jesse and Mackenzie and for uh, them over in Thailand. Come right all the way around, Zach. Come right ahead. Come right ahead. Ava, you, you, you have a prayer? Do you want to pray it for us? I want to pray. Well, let's just do that. I tell you what, if you volunteer, I'll give you the microphone. Zane, you pray for us first, okay? Thank you, God, for this wonderful day and help everybody to... um. To have a good night sleep tonight and um, help the homeless dogs and pets and people. Please, God, they made a home. And help my mom's knees to feel better and her throat. Mm. And help my dad's ears to feel better. And if there's something wrong with his eyes, help that feel better. And um, help me to have a good night sleep and everybody. Help buddy to not get nightmares. Amen. Amen. You pray for it? Yeah, yeah, we will. Go right ahead and pray for us. Thank you for helping us and helping us get up the stairs. And because the people who are hurt needs help, we can help them because there's need help. Because if we don't help them, they will they will lose track. Amen. Thank you so much, Piper. You pray. 
God, thank you for all the things you gave us, and all the people you gave us, and all the houses, and all the beautiful things you gave us. Amen. Amen. Let's take a little minute and pray for, for Mackenzie and Jesse and the girls, okay? Father, we take a moment, surrounded by these wonderful kids, and Lord, we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you're in control of governments and politics and visas and passports. But Lord, we don't always know where you're leading us. So Lord, you told us to come to your throne room boldly. So tonight we pray for Jesse and Mackenzie and for the girls that they'll be able to stay in Thailand. Lord, that's what we ask. If you have another plan, you're, you're just going to need to clarify it to us. But Lord, we pray you open the door and that, that you alone get the credit and praise for it. And that as we do these things, that you'll be honored. Jesse and Mackenzie can refocus and the girls uh, can cannot be anything less than the great blessing that you've provided them for us. And Lord, we just ask right now that you might intervene. We ask that you place someone before them that is compassionate to, to not just American children, but to the very name of Christ, whether they claim it or not. Let those in the Malaysian embassy see the need and the benefit of Jesse and Mackenzie back in Thailand. And we pray it in the matchless name of Jesus. And amen. God bless you and good night. Kids, don't forget your hats.